windy day. We're out here at Fort Meyer Farms in Fairview, Kansas, and Woo! Doug is getting ready to move 110 head of <laughs> Katahdin sheep and his sheep dog uh, to their next paddock. They've spent one day here. This is primarily a uh, brome and clover. And they have one more day of brome and clover and then they're gonna get moved to um, fescue. And the type of fencing we're using here is a two strand poly wire with plastic clip posts. And the outside perimeter is aluminum wire. Uh, he calls it willy wire. And in this paddock, he does not have the poly, uh, poly wire, the electro mesh made by Premier One. He's just using two, two wire. So just moves him down the corner. They all rotate and they're on to the next paddock. That is pretty awesome. strands is sufficient if you move them timely and it's much more I only have to make two trips back and forth not this numerous trips like I used to so it's I think it's a power flex fence poly wire and the posts I think are stay fix and I like those posts multiple I like how there's multiple places where you can gauge how high you want your wire and this this reel looks much more sturdy than the, uh, the one you can buy made by uh, Gallagher this is a very sturdy geared reel so. um, one to one okay and you give them a new bucket of it every day or every week just or? as they no it's it's pretty daily yes and um, the downside is, you know, they don't have all the water they can want to drink, and this makes them more thirsty. So I, I see. Um, but that's fine. I'll give. It. They like it. They like and these it. little troughs, they don't tip them over or anything. These troughs are nice. Are they? they do not. Okay. Yes. Cool. Well, cool. Yeah, we'll uh, carry this over and. So on this fence line here, we have two different uh, sessions of fescue in two completely different uh, stages. This fescue was not grazed uh, from last winter and was not conditioned. And as you can see, there's a lot of thatch and biomass on top. There's a lot of clover intermixed. So it'll make great winter stockpile, but there's a lot of things that maybe the sheep may not find appealing. However, on this side of the fence, we have the same fescue and clover, but we have an August grazing and then shortly thereafter uh, was conditioned with a bush hog. So all of that extra biomass is now uh, thatched down close to the soil and we have new growth that is going to be a lot uh, more bio-friendly for the sheep to digest and they're going to like this a lot more. So my, my curiosity is rather, <clears throat> how shall one condition or graze their winter stockpile? Uh, I wish I had winter stockpile that looked as good as either of these, but at least I have curiosity in seeing how, uh, Doug, you said you haven't seeded for clover in how long? Uh, a decade. And look how much clover is in here, folks. I mean, it's everywhere. 
that just had time to rest and time to go to seed and then were grazed afterwards, no one would ever have to buy clover seed again. It's incredible. Look on the hillside over there. You can't fathom how much protein is sitting over there. Anyway, winter stockpile, two different stages. <laughs> In this pasture, we have another uh, line of experiment to take in. This was grazed in late summer and conditioned with a bush hog. And as the uh, brome went dormant, you can see the difference, and you'll notice over here this was not conditioned. And there was a dramatic difference in how the sheep grazed it on their second pass. And Doug, you said this, this side they, they took well to, and over there nothing was utilized as well. Not nearly as well. Conditioned fescue makes does make a difference. So perhaps there is something to be said for the use of a bush hog in the right circumstances. If we can get rains in late summer, early fall, to be able to get rid of this, you know, overgrowth that isn't really going to be palatable for the animal or useful, but can be utilized at a different canopy level, perhaps down here in the soil to absorb more water because it's certainly not taking in solar energy. It's not gaining us, you know, any photosynthesized nutrients. It might block some wind, which there's something to be said for, but it's not, it's not pumping sunbeams into the soil. It's not feeding earthworms. It's not feeding soil microbes yet. So Doug, this is a, a really nice eye opener for the systematic use of a bush hog and how it affects grazing. Okay, so the section over here to the west uh, we have is, was conditioned late, and so is this. This was grazed heavier, is that right? Yes, heavier, midsummer. And the amount of thatch, Doug said this would not be grazed again yet this year. The sheep will never touch this. However, this, the amount of dead thatch is dramatically less, and there's a lot more. Uh, grazable nutrients here nutritionally this would serve the sheep a lot better in the winter than this would with a little bit better conditioning timing wise the only difference between this section and this section is the timing of the last graze and the conditioning right correct and this one is conditioned later yes yeah and that one did not get clipped by with conditioning conditioning okay. by clipping gotcha so there again the bush hog, when used in the right time, can be your best tool, but the timing must be what is mastered. That is how you can yield winter stockpile with this type of quality. Because it's not about quantity when it comes to winter stockpile. You definitely wanting to acquire, maybe you might not have a lot, but quality is the variable. And you achieve it by mastering the timing. So there you go. So Doug and I have just finished up our, uh, our tour of the farm and we've got to see everything and now we're just going to take some time to kind of, I'm going to ask him some questions about what we saw today. So Doug, why have you chosen the sheep uh, to build the quality of the soil on this farm and how, how have you designed your management practice around that? Okay, I'd start with probably we came onto the farm and our resource is the land and we have chosen to cover that land with grass and we do not want that grass to be hayed and taken off so we need to come up with our way to utilize the grass and that's going to be with sheep. I think sheep are very ad adaptable and they require less um, resource use um, like water. Um, we can forage base sheep quite well they're very adaptable to our farm and our management, and I think sheep are profitable there. The turnaround time of sheep, you can sell them at a younger age, quicker turnover. A lot of interest in sheep for grazing. Um, for us, sheep, it's different too. It's like, maybe we just want to be a little different. Everybody's raising cattle. We don't think cattle are going to work. Let's try sheep. Sheep seem to be working.
Uh, what have you noticed in the long, you've been doing this for over 20 years, what have you noticed in the sheep market throughout the years? Has it fluctuated like the cattle market has? Has the demand rose? Has What has the price done to keep this a profitable enterprise for farmers? I do think prices market for sheep is more consistent, has stayed strong, and the ethnic market is definitely helping the sheep industry. And if a person can tap into that, we have benefited from selling breeding stock, but the direct meat market is very, very beneficial for the small farm sheep producers like us. Let's get into genetics a little bit. Why have you chosen uh, the Katahdin and what have you done with the genetics of that breed to uh, sort of be custom fit for your farm? Katahdin sheep, lower maintenance. We do not need to shear them, do not need to dock tails. They're very adapt adaptable to grazing. But we also realize we have one less product with hair sheep. We do not have the wool, so I just, we think hair sheep are gonna graze on our farm without the shelter. We do not have shade and shelter, so cotton sheep are adapted for that. Genetics, we've stayed with cotton line and we feel selection on grass is where, that's key for us. We, our sheep are selected on forage and that's something that's a little harder to find, I think. So for us, that's, that's been our niche and we're glad for that. If you could give advice to young beginning farmers who are wanting to get into sheep, how, now that you've had all this, these years of experience, if you could go back and do it again, what things would you do to get started? How many would you get? Uh, how would you manage or ro learn how to rotate them? Uh, what would you do? Whatever the number of sheep you start with, and I think a good way for experience is, is small, but at whatever level of sheep production you're doing, always pay attention to your grass. Because if you keep your grass healthy and growing and vibrant, you're gonna have um, lower feed costs. You can graze them on grass. And um, so just pay attention to your grass. If you're willing to put the time and effort, labor into fencing, the more you can give your grass and land rest, you'll benefit from that as well. So put the effort into it. And um, like Matt says, get out there with your feet and feel it. Yeah. So we're big about the quality of soil that we build. Uh, my last question is about the forage and the evolution of the quality of forage you've had on this farm. Ha have you primarily always, has this farm always been perennial based grass forage or, or was it annual at one time? And how did you uh, adapt or evolve the quality of forage over the years? 25 years ago, my dad and mom gave us the opportunity to come back to the farm and we were able to, over time, convert row crop land into our grasses and that was very timely. We could establish cool season and that included the fescue for our winter grazing, brome, clover and alfalfa for our summer diversified grazing. So to have mixes of forages has helped our animals grazing but it's also made our soil more productive because we've got the variety it's there's not a monoculture except sheep on our farm and yeah all we have is sheep that's we've kind of limited ourselves maybe but that's what i can handle one group at a time yeah well doug thank you a lot for letting us come to your farm this today. has been so much fun for me to be here with matt on our farm and just know what he's doing on his farm so this has been great. I've yeah. never been on camera before. Yeah. So, wow. <laughs> yeah, this has been fun. Jared and Myra, <laughs> we're thinking of you guys today too. We'll, we'll be over to see you guys soon. And uh, for you, those of you out there who are thinking about uh, raising sheep on a small scale or a large scale like what Doug's doing, uh, they are they're easy to adapt to any circumstance. That's the one thing I've learned about sheep is whatever your circumstances are, you can find a way to, to let sheep mold into that situation and to build the quality of your soil and your forage on your farm too. So we'll be back uh, next week with some different things about sheep. Thank you guys for staying tuned and we'll see you guys next time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. <laughs>